resurrection of the dead. It's a big concept. It's a concept that a lot of people have a, a difficult time wrapping their, their minds around. The average enlightened individual sees the idea of a bodily resurrection as a, a really fantastic belief that's set aside maybe for horror films or you know, something that's only thought about by religious fundamentalists. Many people are very surprised to discover that the resurrection, the idea of bodily, bodily resurrection, is one of the main pillars on which the Jewish religion is, uh, is founded upon. It's the 13th of the 13 principles of faith. Resurrection of the dead at some point in the messianic future is very much a Jewish belief. To the point where the sages said that if a person denies the reality of the resurrection, that the body will resurrect at some point in the messianic future, they have denied the entire Torah. That's a very strong statement. Furthermore, it says that one who rejects the belief is one who, will not, who won't merit being a part of it, like a measure for measure. Oh, you didn't believe? Okay, have it your way. That's the Talmud says that, the Gemara in Sanhedrin. That's the measure for measure. So it's very much a central part of being a Jew, of, of Jewish belief. The Talmud relates that the idea of resurrection is alluded to in the text of the five books of Moses. And the books of the prophets as well have outright predictions of future resurrection. The book of Isaiah says in no uncertain terms that your dead will live, the corpses will rise, you, will you who lie in the dust awake and shout for joy. Yechezkel, the prophet Ezekiel, assures the people that then you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and, leave you uh, and lead you out of your graves as my people. The prophet Daniel, an angel tells the prophet Daniel, many of those who lie in the dust of the ground will awake. So a fundamental point of Jewish tradition maintains that Jewish souls, all, all, every Jew who ever lived, and the righteous from among the nations will resurrect when Mashiach comes. At, at a certain point when Mashiach comes, every Jew and the righteous from among the nations as well will have a have a part in that will come back, will live again. It's something that is repeated daily in our prayers, this concept. In fact, the Anaf Yosef in the Siddur Eitzer HaTfilois says that when we say Maida Ani every morning, thanking God for restoring our soul, it thanks God daily for sort of like a mini resurrection. We say that, you know, when our when we go to sleep, that our neshama, our soul, for lack of a better term, leaves our body. That sleep is sort of one sixtieth the experience of death. And then we wake, wake, wake up in the morning, it's like a mini resurrection. And so when we recall Maidani thanking God for, for waking us up in the morning, that we're alive another day, it's a glimmer of the reminder of the future redemption. Every day in the Shimon Ezra, the Amidah, we bless God as he who resurrects the dead. It's a fundamental belief in our, in our tradition, in our religion. In truth, you know, initially it sounds like this fantastic idea. It's like this, well, how, can, how can a modern, sophisticated person you know, believe such an idea? But in truth, the future resurrection is not a difficult one to accept at all. Okay, let's take a step back. Right? It's already clear that God created the world something from nothing. Right? That is something, that, that's something that most Jews don't have a problem accepting. God made the world something out of nothing. He created somethingness out of complete nothingness. So why then would it be difficult for God, or excuse me, why would it be difficult for us to comprehend that God could create a second time from something that already exists? To create somethingness from somethingness when he already created somethingness from absolute nothingness. If we examine the world carefully, one will find that there's really a glimmer of resurrection built into the workings of the entire natural world. The French philosopher Francois Voltaire said that it's no more surprising to be born twice 
than once. Everything in nature is resurrection. Think about a caterpillar. Caterpillar spins itself a cocoon. It remains inside until ostensibly it dies. Parts of it decay, it becomes just a thick liquid. Eventually, this liquid blob becomes a beautiful butterfly with wings that burst from the cocoon and flies through the air. The entire appearance and the lifestyle and the eating habits of the butterfly are completely different than the caterpillar. It's like a completely different creature. Rabbi Israel Lifshitz, known as the Tiferes Yisrael, explains that one of the reasons that God created this creature and that it had to go undergo this process of sort of dying and re-emerging in a transformed state was to echo that, that which will take place during the resurrection of the dead. Yes, this metamorphic process. Yeah. An example, another example in nature of resurrection, so to speak, can also be seen just in the cycle of growing vegetation and trees. A planted seed, you plant a seed in the ground, only after it rots under the ground, only after some time does it start to sprout into a healthy tree with beautiful fruits and flowers, many times larger and greater than, its original, than the original planted seed. But only after the seed is buried and it rots does it become this, this, glor this glorified, wondrous thing, this entity filled with, with fruits and flowers and all the things that trees have, is only after this burial experience. And so this idea, again, is ingrained in Jewish tradition that this echoes the resurrection of the dead. In fact, there is a custom. There is a custom uh, in in Jewish tradition, that when a person leaves a cemetery, a Jewish cemetery, there's a custom of uprooting some grass, taking some grass and uprooting it. And this idea is connected with a verse in Tillam, a verse in the Psalms, from Psalm 103, which says that man's days are like grass. He blossoms like a flower. That's what the verse says. Man's days are like grass. He blossoms like a flower. So this indicates that just as grass seeds sprout after being buried in the earth, so too man will, uh, man will uh, come forth alive from the grave as well. That's mentioned, by the, that's mentioned in the Be'er Hetiv in, in Yaradeh in the, in the Shulchan Aruch, the Code of Jewish Law. So one of, the, one of the commentaries explains that this plucking up of grass, the comparison of a human being to grass, is that a human being, just like a tree, just like a plant, grows only after it's, it is buried into the ground, only comes to its fullest potential, only shows its most beautiful uh, culmination, its pinnacle, is only after it's buried in the ground. This idea is, was actually used as an analogy by the Talmudic sages to describe to the ancient pagans the idea of resurrection. When the Egyptian queen Cleopatra had trouble fathoming the concept of an enhanced life back in the body uh, after it decayed, Rabbi Meir, one of our sages, responded with the example of a wheat seed which decomposes before sprouting new life. A related phenomenon about resurrection, or about how we see resurrection, the concept existing uh, all over the place, is that if you look at the forest in the winter, I remember, you know, I grew up in Florida, I remember the first time I went, I went to, to school, to rabbinical school, and to, to, you know, to college, in rabbinical college in, uh, in New Jersey, in the Northeast. So when I, when I got there, that was like the first time that I experienced snow in winter. <laughs> And so when you get there and you experience that for the first time, you know, Florida is just life all the time. It's sunny most days, you know, and even if it's raining, just wait five minutes and it will stop. But when you get to the Northeast, you can have six months of dreary gray skies. Then it gets dark at four o'clock and you look out into this vast forest and you just see what looks like death. <laughs> Meaning, trees, no leaves. It looks like a bitter wasteland. Little do we know 
or little, if you, if you only knew, if you only saw that view, little do you know that right around the corner, come springtime, right, just a few months away, that forest will be transformed. It will be covered with lush foliage and filled with life of spring birds and animals. So if, I, if you only knew, when I, when I looked at it, I was like, oh my gosh, what did I get myself into? I came in the winter. I came in, in January time. Oh, oh my gosh, this is where I'm living now? This is what I'm... But little, you just, you don't, don't take that at face value. Don't take the, it, the here and the now as the eternal end. Know that just around the corner, this place is going to be booming with life and beauty. In the modern era, it should not be difficult at all to grasp the idea that the body can resurrect. We know, it's known now, more than any time in history, that nothing can truly be created or destroyed. Nothing can ever be destroyed. It merely changes into a different form. In the late 1700s, it was discovered that matter can only change form and shape, but always retains its mass. Meaning you can burn it, pulverize it, do whatever you want to it. It's, it can never be destroyed. You're just changing its form. Later on, it was discovered that energy is the same way. That, you, that energy can't be created or destroyed. It just can be changed. It just its form can be changed. And then Einstein later proved that mass and energy are really just one and the same thing, two sides of the same coin. Nothing can be created or destroyed. So no matter how much something is pulverized, it's, it's not gone forever. It's worth noting, by the way, that Judaism understood this concept centuries before it was realized in uh, our secular societies. King Solomon said, I know that whatever God does, it shall be forever, because nothing can be added to it or anything taken away. What God does is forever. Can't change that. Rav Sadi 1,500 years ago, elaborates on this topic also. He says, even if an object is burned with fire, it can never be annihilated completely because it's impossible to destroy something to the point that it becomes nothing. That is something reserved only for the creator who himself created something from nothing. We can never transform somethingness into absolute nothingness. We can change its form, we can grind it, we can burn it, we can do whatever we want to it. The existence, the matter, always stays. We can never fully, dis nothing is ever destroyed. In our modern era, the idea of DNA makes the idea of resurrection intellectually acceptable and feasible to even the most ardent rationalist. The fact that every cell contains the information to reconstruct the entire body and the scientific success in cloning a living creature from a living cell shows that the idea of a bodily resurrection is not as far-fetched as was once thought. I recently had a conversation with somebody who said that, they said, <laughs> I had just met them, but they said, you know, I, I was talking to my rabbi, and my rabbi told me that, that he believes that in this concept of Mashiach, that there's going to be this Messiah figure, and that eventually the, the dead are going to resurrect. I had the conversation literally last week. And he was, like, he, he's, he was kind of like shocked. And then he asked me, he's like, well, do you believe that too? I'm like, well, it's kind of it comes with the territory. And I said, what, what exactly do you find you know, so hard to believe about that? He says, well, it just sounds like such a, such a, a wacky, out-of-the-box you know, concept. But if we think about it in our own time, with the idea of DNA and the idea of cloning, the idea of remaking a body, from already existing matter, it doesn't seem like such a far-fetched idea. It seems like something that even we can do in some ways. Like, I don't want to say that we don't need God, but if it's something that even we can do, it's a cinch for God. In 2009, there was a really interesting article in National Geographic magazine. There was a bunch of researchers who sought to bring back a variety of extinct animals, including a woolly mammoth. Could you imagine? Could you imagine? You know that in Siberia, there are literally millions 
of almost perfectly preserved woolly mammoths with flesh and all buried in the permafrost of the ice. So well intact were many of them that the meat had been eaten recently. People had have eaten that meat because it was so preserved in the ice. I mean, I don't know if I would want to sample it, <laughs> but you right, exactly. <laughs> but there, there were uh, there were quite a number of people in relatively recent history that had actually eaten mammoth meat. Could you imagine? The animal's been extinct for several thousand years. So this group of people, so not only we don't just have cells or little you know, traces, we have full mammoths at our disposal. We have all, the, all of the intact information that we need, that these researchers needed to, to create, or to, to, to resurrect the woolly mammoth. So in the article, again, this is from 2009, it was in National Geographic, very, you know, very ubiquitous magazine, very you know, well-liked, whatever. So the discussion amongst these researchers was if it should be done. To almost like create, you know, remember 20 years ago that there was Jurassic Park, yeah. right? So it's almost to create like a, with other extinct animals, like a Jurassic Park style park. A mammoth zoo. Could you imagine this wacky idea? And so when these researchers were discussing it, they weren't really, the, the, the focus of the conversation wasn't whether it was possible or not to do. But it was just the ethical ramifications in doing so. Is it the right thing to do? Doing it wasn't, wasn't this insurmountable thing. Doing it was almost a given. It was just ethically, is this the right thing? Should we not? Eh. So Tom Gilbert who was an expert in ancient DNA at Copenhagen University, optimistically predicted, said something very interesting in the article. He says, if you can do it with a mammoth, you can do it with anything else that has passed, including your grandmother. That's what he said. So the idea of rebuilding the body from scratch, from nothing, basically, is not a far-fetched idea, even for humans, even for us. So for God, eh, cinch. You know, modern technology can sometimes be a tangible reminder of a neglected spiritual concept. The Chafetz Chaim gave an example of this. He said that when many people would falsely claim, when like the tone of society was this false claim that God doesn't pay attention to what occurs in the world since he's so far away. Around that time, that's when there was the inspiration to have this invention called a telescope. Showing that even mankind has the possibility, the ability to view the heavens despite the great distance from earth. So when this spiritual concept, this spiritual void or doubt was present was lacking, a technological advance that even humans can do it surfaced. When the car GPS systems uh, were first becoming popular, what it was 10, 15 years ago, whatever it was, contemporary rabbis often used it as an analogy for God knowing where a person is at all times. Right? Something that perhaps in our society is something that we don't always pay attention to. Well, God, ah, is God really watching? Is he involved? Ah. Well, if we can do it, so just a little reminder, a little glimmer of what's going on upstairs, that God's also involved in watching and knows exactly where we are at every single moment. So likewise, this, this, this idea of cloning is not intended to minimize the future resurrection that will take place, that, which will take place in a, you know, in a miraculous way, but it merely shows that human beings can more or less recreate an entire organism. How much more infinitely more so can God do it? So I would say it makes more sense today, or it's more, it makes more rational sense that resurrection of the dead can take place nowadays than it would 500 years ago. I could understand their, their if they had a quandary or if they had a question on the, the dead resurrecting, I could understand 500 years ago. 
But now even we have the ability, so to speak, to do it. So if anything, it makes more sense now than it ever did that such a thing could take place. Why a bodily resurrection? In Jewish tradition, body and soul are a team. They're a team that's set out to accomplish a specific goal of li- uplifting the world, the physical world, through Torah and mitzvahs. The objective in Judaism is not to escape the world, but to live within the world, and, but uh, sanctify it. Sanctify it through the observance of mitzvahs. And you need both body and soul to do that. You need body and soul. You can't do a mitzvah without a body, but you won't have the inspiration or the inclination to do the mitzvah without the soul. So you need both. The effect that charity has in the world, giving charity, the coin cannot be given without a physical hand. The kind word to another cannot be done without the physical mouth. It's a two-way street. You need a body and a soul. You need a body and an enlivening force. So being that that's the case, both get rewarded. Both experience reward, body and soul. It's kind of like, imagine there was a house on fire. And observing this house on fire, you have one man who's blind, and the other man who's a cripple. He's physically handicapped, can't walk. So the blind one feels the heat of the, of the fire, but he can't see, and he can't rescue the people that are inside because he can't see, it'll, it's an, it'll danger his life. And the, the other one, the guy in the wheelchair, he can see exactly what's going on, but he, he can't see everybody's life because he has these limitations. So what do they do? Well, the blind one puts the, puts the one in the wheelchair on his shoulders, and they go in and they save everyone in the house. Literally rescue everybody. So now the mayor comes. These guys are heroes. Job well done. Got to give the key to the city, but who do we give it to? And so they start arguing amongst them. Well, you know, if you, if you didn't have my eyes, says the guy in the wheelchair, if you didn't have my eyes, you would never be able to see where anybody is. And the blind one says, well, if you didn't have my legs, you wouldn't be able to see it. We wouldn't be able to, to help anybody. You wouldn't be able to, to drag anybody out. So the mayor says, okay, I'll reward both of you. You both get the key to the city. In a very similar way, this is the body and soul after its time on this earth. The soul, the soul wants its reward, and the soul deserves its reward for all the good things that it did. But what about the body? The soul would not be able to express itself, to do the physical mitzvahs, all of, all of the positive things that we're meant to do in this world without the means of a body. So both are rewarded. And that's why the ultimate, the ultimate reward when Mashiach comes entails body and soul. This is the majority opinion, that this is the ultimate, the ultimate um, bit of reward. It, that the ultimate reward encompasses both body and soul. So in the same way, in the future, God will judge body and soul together either rewarding or correcting them both as one unit. In the Messianic future, when the dead will live once again, the entire world will have reached its pinnacle. And the true, pro- uh, the true purpose of God's creation to bestow His goodness and handiwork will be experienced forever. That's what we're looking to. Just to conclude uh, tonight's talk, we talked about the world history being on a cosmic clock, that we are nearing Shabbos, that we're near, or Friday afternoon we're nearing Shabbos. As we discussed last week, it's a mitzvah to take in Shabbos early. What? No, not to wait till the last second, till the sun goes down over the horizon and wait till that last moment, but it's actually a mitzvah. We're actually supposed to add a bit of time, a little time of Shabbos observance to enhance, to, uh, to bring holiness into the rest of the week, to make Friday, transform Friday, and Friday early, a little bit early, or a lot early, depending on how much you want to do, uh, and make it Shabbos, accept Shabbos early, and let Shabbos go out late. So too, on the cosmic clock of our history, 
it's a mitzvah to accept Shabbos early. We don't want to wait. We're Friday afternoon. One of the things that we're told in our tradition is that Mashiach's coming is largely influenced by our deeds. The Rambam, the Rambam quotes the Talmud, and the Rebbe stressed the Rambam's uh, idea many times that a person should always see themselves and the world as equally balanced with good and evil, with mitzvahs and, and the opposite. And one more mitzvah that a person does is going to tip the scale and bring themselves personal redemption and bring the world to its ultimate redemption. And so being that our history, our culmination, Mashiach's coming is dependent or is at least hastened through our deeds, I want to encourage everyone to view themselves starting this week when they're conflicted in a situation. Should I do it? Do I want, if you're feeling lazy, should I put the extra effort? Is it, uh, should I, should I, should I, should I, should I, should I push myself? I'm not, I'm not interested. I'm not feeling good. I'm tired, whatever. Push yourself a little extra hard. Think of yourself as that the one more mitzvah, one more thing that we do could be the thing that tips the scales and brings redemption to the entire world. Have a wonderful week.